Probably the hardest thing to understand about basic tissue optics of absorption and scattering is this idea about the directionality of scattering and how we reconceive of that in order to make problems easy to model. So consider you've got a beam that's coming along, and I'm going to think about that as a collimated beam, so I'm going to write it as having a certain intensity, power per unit area, and I'll just call that beam I. And as that beam hits a scatterer, I'll draw a little target there, we're going to have some amount of scattering that comes off of it. And I'm going to draw this distribution here that's somewhat forward directed, as you've seen in previous videos. So a couple of things to point out about this. First of all, let's note that there is scattering in all directions. So when we talk about the scattering by a particle, we're talking about photons going off in all directions. The second thing uh, I want to emphasize is that this beam loses intensity as it passes through and interacts with this scatterer. So the total intensity lost by this beam due to scattering over a distance dx is given by its initial intensity i times mu s dx. We've already covered that before. We're no longer concerned with the total amount of scattering. That's given by mu s. We want to talk about the direction of the scattering and the fact that it's not isotropic in all directions. So we have to think about an expression that describes this distribution here. So we have a relative probability of scattering. That's the way we talk about it. The particle has scattered a photon. What's the relative probability that it goes in a particular angular direction? So we have relative probability versus angle. And we name that relative probability P of solid angle direction omega d omega. So this is a little bit of solid angle. This quantity under braced here is a probability density per unit solid angle. If you multiply it by a small amount of solid angle, you get a small amount of probability that the light scattered into that particular solid angle range. We have a normalization here. The normalization for probability in, in general is that it has to scatter somewhere because we're already talking about a scattering event. And so if we integrate over four pi to radians, all of the probability density integrated over all steradians, we have to get one. So let's right off the bat notice that if we have isotropic scattering, that is scattering that's equally likely to go in any direction, then that would be the case that the probability density has no dependence upon direction and it has a magnitude of 1 over 4 pi. So if we integrate, of course, 1 over 4 pi, Overall angle, overall solid angle, we would get 1 over 4 pi times 4 pi steradians, and we would get back a 1, as we expect. All right, so let's take this distribution that we've got up here. Let's just copy it over down at, in the middle here. So I'm going to consider a situation where there's a lot of scattering towards the right, just like that one. There's a lot of forward scattering. There isn't a lot of backward scattering. And then there's some smooth distribution of the likelihood of scattering into other directions. We'll draw a dashed line around that. So there's our polar plot of the likelihood of scattering into different directions. The beam was coming in from this direction. We can mark off for a particular direction. The deflection from forward is what we would call an angle theta. So this is real scattering that actually happens this way. It's usually anisotropic that way. So I'm going to label this as the anisotropic case. And what we mean by it being anisotropic is that the average value of that scattering angle theta, the average value rather of the cosine of that angle, notice the cosine of theta, it's going to be 1 for totally forward directed light, negative 1 for totally backward directed light, it would be zero for straight up or straight down as drawn in this diagram. So in this situation, 
the cosine of theta averaged over this distribution, it's greater than zero because there's more forward directed than backward directed light. And we're going to name this quantity, this average value of the cosine of theta, and we're going to call it g. We can think about a beam that passes through a material that scatters light this way, and we can ask, how does that beam's intensity fall off with propagation distance? So that beam, it's going to start off with an intensity I0. As that beam passes through more and more scattering material, and if there's also absorption in it, as you've seen previously, we would say that the total loss is due to the sum of an absorption coefficient and there's a scattering coefficient that I'll highlight. And it goes with propagation distance x, so that's the exponential decay. Now we can think about what if it hadn't been anisotropic? What would it be like if we had a scatterer with the same US value but isotropic scattering? So that would be a situation where, I'll write it over here on the left, where we would have scattering that looks like this. Equal in all directions. So there's our distribution. I'll label that as being isotropic. In the isotropic case, what's different is that the a average value of the cosine of theta now equals zero. So if I was going to talk about the g value for this isotropic case, it wouldn't be the same as the anisotropic case. g would now be zero. And the beam propagation, if I pass light through a material with this sort of scatterers in it, it would have exactly the same formula as before. Mu a plus mu s times x. So I'll emphasize that on this level, these quantities are the same. In these two materials, as the beam passes through the scatterers, you will deplete the beam by the same amount, but the scattered light will be more forward direction directed in this case than it would in this case. So to try to preserve mu s and pretend that an anisotropic material is isotropic could be a pretty bad choice because the light that's scattered, which is the light we're actually usually going to detect if we're, say, shining light into our finger and trying to get light back from our finger, the scattered light is highly forward directed in the tissue, and so pretending that the scattering events are actually isotropic might not be the choice you want to make. We generally make another choice in biomedical optics, and what we do is we, we try to approximate this anisotropic light with a sum of two distributions. So first of all, we pretend that what happened here, instead of actually anisotropic scattering, we create a smaller amount of isotropic scattering. How much smaller? We're going to weight that amount. Instead of it being a unit amount, we're going to have 1 minus g of that isotropic scattering where g is given by what the actual average cosine is for the true anisotropic distribution. Then we're going to add to that a totally forward-directed component. If you imagine adding this arrow to this rightward-going arrow here, the idea is that you would get this arrow here. And if you add this arrow to this arrow here, if i drawn it accurately, you get this arrow here. That's not drawn too accurately. But I think you can see that this arrow is now biasing this distribution to have more forward directed and less backward than backward directed light. And we're going to weight this quantity, the forward directed part, by an amount g. Now we're going to call this reduced scattering. And we're calling it reduced scattering because what we're actually going to say is that this light here, we're going to say it didn't scatter. It actually stayed as part of the incident beam. Because that's appropriate, right? The incident beam is heading off to the right. This 
delta function is also heading off to the right. It's as if we consider some amount of this anisotropic scattering to have actually stayed in the incident beam and not actually have scattered. That's why we say that this is the reduced scattering approximation. Now, if you take the anisotropy of this plus the anisotropy of this, the average value of the cosine of the scattering, the cosine of the theta of the scatter, well, this is going to average out to zero, and this is going to average out to one times g. So the average value of the cosine of theta, if you average over all values, you're going to get g. So it exactly, so now we've got a situation where the reduced scattering distribution matches the same g that the anisotropic version had. However, what's not going to be the same is that the beam propagation, as we propagate through this reduced medium, is going to go as I naught times e to the minus, well, what? So we still have the mu a, but we don't have as much scattering as we did before. Here, the total amount of light was scattered. Here, only 1 minus g of 100% was scattered. So I have to modify my use of mu s by saying only that much of mu s now contributes to scattering. The rest we're going to keep in the unscattered beam. And this is this conceptual point that makes this whole topic hard, is that we're pretending some of the scattered light actually didn't scatter. Now we're going to give a name to this product, 1 minus g times mu s. We're going to define that to be mu s prime, and that has the name of the reduced scattering coefficient. Just to wrap up, you might wonder, okay, so what actually is the probability density distribution for this reduced scattering beam? And that would be it's equal to a delta function in the zero direction, in other words, theta equals zero, times g plus an isotropic component. As we said, an isotropic component has a 1 over 4 pi, but we're going to have to multiply that by 1 minus g because not all of the scattering is in that direction. So our scattering phase function here, if you wanted to think of it this way, has a totally forward-going delta function of weight g and a 1 minus g isotropic component. It is in this sense that the average value of the cosine of the scattering angle is g. You might be confused because once we say that this light didn't even scatter, obviously the average angle of scattering for this light is zero. But by re So by reducing the amount of scattering that we assign to the 1 minus g part, we're sort of getting the right overall distribution, but our bookkeeping actually becomes very easy because now we're pretending that this light is scattering isotropically, just not as many photons are scattering. This then leads to a concept of a reduced scattering step size, where we would say that instead of the length of the average scattering step, the, the mean free path between scattering events, that would be 1 over mu s, we would now say that the reduced scattering length, we would expect that to be longer because we can travel farther without getting scattered because we've reduced the likelihood of scattering. Only 1 minus g has, is now scattering instead of 100% scattering. So ls prime becomes 1 over mu s prime, which is 1 over 1 minus g mu s. So compared to 1 over mu s, We've made the denominator smaller, therefore we've made ls prime bigger than ls, which is what you would expect here, larger step size because there's a lower likelihood of scattering.